Hi folks, welcome to Walking on the Ween side part of It Matters Radio. Today I have a special treat if you uh, like myself and enjoy the world of travel because my guest today is Christopher Elliott who, well, now you may have be familiar with him because for example if you go to any of the newspapers it's like the San Francisco Chronicle or the Boston Globe, the Carrie King Features syndicated columns, you'll have seen his name. If you go to the Washington Post and check out the column called The Navigator, you might know his name because he writes it. He also writes uh, USA Today's weekly on travel column. And then, well, a few other places like National Geographic, NPR, Smithsonian, Travel and Leisure. Nothing, nothing anybody would have heard of, right, Chris? No. Well, yeah. All completely obscure publications, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I, I um, have to start. I'm, I'm honored to write for these places. <laughs> I, I have to start by asking you my, my favorite question there, anybody who travels, what in all of the traveling you've done, what was your favorite destination and why? Well, that's really hard to answer because I love almost every place that I go to. Um, I was just in Salt Lake City a day and a half ago and I loved it. It was, you know, so, there's so many amazing things about Salt Lake City. It was when we were there, you had the mountains and we got snow. Mm -hmm. And so the ski resorts open that week. It's a very special week there. And then you have, of course, the Mormon Tabernacle, and which is an amazing building. Gorgeous. And but the Natural History Museum, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and a lot of great restaurants too. Yes. So we had a terrific time there. And so I, I could say that about any place. In fact, if, if I were to, if I had to answer your question, I would say the, the my favorite destination is the one I. I've just been to. Ah, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you go skiing while you were in Salt Lake? No, but we're going to go back in February. We're going to rent a place for the entire month of February, and we're going to hit as many of the ski resorts as we can to write about them, which uh, I can't wait for. The snow wasn't quite there. We went. We took that uh, aerial tramway up at Snowbird. We went to the top. And they had probably about half a foot of snow, beautiful powder snow. And we were just chomping on the bit. Going, We've got to come back here and ski. Yeah. So we we're going to do it. Now, the we in that sentence, who, who is the we? The we is uh, my three children, uh, Aaron, who is 15, Aiden is 12, almost 13, and Eris, my daughter, who is 11. So I travel with them. Mm -hmm. And they're homeschool. They do their lessons in the morning and then in the afternoon. And I do all my writing in the morning and in the afternoon. We go out and explore. Uh, it must be a lot of fun traveling with three kids. That those without age range. They 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 must really have a lot of curiosity about the world. They yeah they do. Uh, it's uh, traveling with kids is it's fun. It can be very challenging sometimes. But it can also be very rewarding. And I've been doing this on again and off again since 2010. And we, we took our kids uh, for, and out in 2010. We've, I think we're on the road for 200 days. There are actually a lot of families that do this, mm -hmm. I've found. Um, uh, because of one of the things that I do uh, as a travel columnist is I'm look, always looking for trends. And one of the trends I discovered was families that in some cases have sold all of their earthly possessions and yeah. are moving from place to place. And they are, they think of education very differently than you and I might. They are, they're thinking to themselves that the best form of education happens outside of the classroom and that uh, it's better to, instead of writing a term paper on the Colosseum in Rome, to actually visit the Colosseum Absolutely. and see and touch and, uh, and read the, and, and hear the people talking about it. And that, that, that's more effective than any kind of a research paper that you could do. Absolutely. And, so that's that's kind of how I feel about it now. Is that uh, it's better to actually be there and do it than to sit in a library and read about it. Yeah. 
and I'm sure the kids agree with you. Yes. Um, well, in fact, here comes one right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a random in interview. You see, kids. Um, and uh, yeah, they. I, I think that I've. Well, I've always given them the opportunity to. You know, they, I said, look, you, if you kids don't like to travel, we can we can settle in one place, and you guys can go to a, a real school, and you can you know do all that and have friends and and. They, you know, every time I offer that, they say, no, 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 we want to travel. We really enjoy traveling. Mm -hmm. And so, so far, so good. Now, that could change. I mean, mm -hmm. kids are kids. They, they can change their minds sometimes. Mm -hmm. so we'll just have to see what happens. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up doing travel writing? Is that what you set out to do when you were a kid? Or how did you, what's your path to this fascinating profession? I don't know if I ever set out to be a travel writer. I actually started as a financial journalist, and um, my first job out of graduate school was working for Dow Jones, writing for the Wall Street Journal. And then after that, I, uh, you know, I didn't. I was doing it for about a year and a half, and I realized that I wasn't going anywhere. I literally was not going anywhere. I was sitting in a, uh, at an office, in an office at a desk every day. And I uh, wrote a story about an initial public offering, a stock offering for one of the cruise lines. And I interviewed people who wrote for the, some of the travel magazines that covered the cruise industry. And I, I asked them about their lifestyle. And they said, oh, yeah, I'm traveling a lot. I'm on cruise ships a lot. And I thought, oh, that would be a great lifestyle. I'd love to do that. And so I got a job, uh, to make a very long story short, uh, with a, a travel magazine mm -hmm. and uh, then from there on I kind of got drawn into advocacy because I saw a lot of travelers who didn't have anyone to really fight for their cause and so that became my thing then. Mm -hmm. So when you say for, fight for their cause and advocacy I, I, that's that was where I was going to go next because that's a big part of what you do as a writer but maybe you could explain to the audience just what that means. Well, it was a little bit more circuitous than that. I didn't, you know, get immediately recruited as a consumer advocate. I, I was working for one of the travel trade publications, and it was always about the money, about the commission, about how can we sell more of this or that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. but I also got a glimpse of the other side. Sometimes a travel agent or a travel supplier would sell a vacation that wasn't right for a customer. Sometimes an airline would do something that was not right and you would end up with paying for a ticket that you couldn't use. And I would hear from those passengers and from those travelers. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I began to realize that there was a need for someone to answer those questions. So over time, you know, this took a couple of years before I, you know, it wasn't like some, some, you know, no light bulb. Needs in Damascus, <laughs> the scales coming off your eyes and going, oh, I'm a consumer advocate now. It was more than, it was more of a gradual process. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I started kind of on a lark writing about these cases on my website in 98 and 99. Mm -hmm. And, and from, from that point, I realized that there was no one else in the travel industry who was really doing this. Mm -hmm. There were maybe one or two other people who were handling them on a very limited basis. Uh, Condé Nast Traveler, for example, had an ombudsman, but they would only do one case per month. Right. So that left, that was 12 people that they could help in a year. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, well, what if I did this online? I could help many more people. And so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, and it just grew from there. Uh, the, there were newspapers that started picking the column up. And then, and then from that, that point on, it got into more than travel. And now I help people who, are, who have problems with many other things, you know, broken appliances, TVs that are burned out, whatever, uh, cars that turn out to be lemons. Um, and, and it's really become my kind of full-time thing is helping people out. Now, if, I, that obviously, people who just heard you say that, they're thinking to themselves, oh, my God. I could use help with this. Yes. <laughs> so how do they reach out to you 
It's really easy. Uh, if you go to my website, which is Elliot.org, that's E-L-L-I-O-T-T dot O-R-G, so two L's and two T's, you can go to Elliot.org forward slash help, or you can follow the link at the front page, and there's a form that you fill out, and that form allows me to collect all the information that I need to help you. I can't guarantee that I'll help you. Sometimes cases can't be mediated, but frequently there's something that can be done, and so if you fill out that form, uh, either I'll get back to you personally, or I have I work with some volunteers, and and we'll get right back to you and help. Mm-hmm. Oh, you have, you have. I was going to ask you: Do you have besides the kids? Obviously, you can put them to work. <laughs> do you have other people <laughs> yes. helping you? I do. I have uh, some wonderful volunteers that I work with, and it, this is kind of turned into much more than just one guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, in fact, just before I got on the phone with you. I, I was talking with someone else and, and about how the organization has evolved into a group of probably about 100 volunteers, not all active, but uh, we're, I think that this might turn into something that's, that goes way beyond just one columnist helping people, and uh, we're already talking about maybe turning it into a real organization with uh, you know, a board of directors and things like that, so who knows what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll be right back to follow up because that's a fascinating topic. But first, this. Read Christopher Elliott. He's fighting the never ending battle for hassle free travel. USA Today. Welcome back to Walking on the Lean Side. And today we are talking with travel expert and consumer advocate, Christopher Elliott. And Chris, you were talking about growing this organization. And I think that's... Now, are your are your volunteers all in one place, or are you doing this online? Or? No, we're actually online, all of us. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm in Prescott, Arizona right now, but mm-hmm. next week I'm going to probably be in Phoenix, and then in a few weeks I'll be... I don't even know where I'm going to be, probably in Colorado somewhere. And we have uh, volunteers everywhere. We've got our research director is in the UK. We have uh, our managing director is in New Jersey. We have people in California. So we're really spread out everywhere, we're virtual. So and now that I think brings up organizations. The, the mirror question to the one I asked you before the break about how do people reach out to you for help? How do yeah. people reach out to you if they want to be part of giving that help? Oh, well, if you be a volunteer, uh, there's also a form on the site. If you if you go on to the site, Elliot.org, that's two L's and two T's, forward slash volunteer, you can fill out that form. You can also navigate to it from the front page. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm really easy to reach. I mean, I publish my email address and my phone number on my site, and then, you know, if you... If you call me, uh, my phone will ring and I'll answer it. Uh, I'm I'm really as accessible as I possibly can be. I think the only thing that I do is I turn my phone off at night so that I can sleep. But that's pretty much the only time I'm not available. How dare you not be 24-7? <laughs> <laughs> How dare I? I know. Sorry. I got to sleep too. <laughs> but so... This is an organization, no, and not just a person. This is Elliot.org yeah. is really not just Chris Elliot. It's a whole group of people working with you and under your, uh, I guess, supervision, but also your, your inspiration, more importantly, to make a difference for consumers and travelers. But, but Right, and, and you know, the... Uh, you can look at a site at our site and, and look at the uh, and I, I use our uh, not as in like the royal we. It really is, it's it belongs to. I think that the site belongs to the readers. It doesn't really belong to me, mm-hmm. and it, it belongs to the volunteers. But you, we have a mission statement on the site um, about how the kind of world we're trying to build. Um, that sounds really lofty, but it's actually pretty simple. We're trying to have a a we want things to be fair and reasonable. We want uh, companies to sell uh, good products at a fair price, uh, no hidden fees, no gotchas. And uh, we want consumers to be empowered. 
uh, our our whole goal is not for us to have to go in and save the day, although we will if we have to, but for consumers to make informed purchases. And then if something does go wrong, that they have the ability to self-advocate. So they, they have all of the tools that they need to try to get a refund or an apology or a replacement. And then if that doesn't work, they have all the information they need to appeal to a manager. And see, the thing is, not to get too far off topic, but a lot of companies will will try to hide the names and email addresses and phone numbers of their executives. So one of the things that we do is we have a research department and we will go out and find those names, numbers, and emails and publish them. It drives the companies crazy because you know, I don't know how many times you've been on the phone with someone maybe on an on off, uh, offshore call center. They barely speak English and they tell you, you say, well, is there a manager that I can speak with? And they say, no, I'm the only manager. There is no manager. And you go, oh, wait, you're a major American corporation. You should have like someone who is in charge of customer service. Can't I appeal this to them? And they go, no, there is no one else. Well, our researchers, they're really good. They go out and they find that someone else, uh -huh. publish that person's information online, and and then we wait for the cease and desist letter to come from the company, and then we tell them we have a little thing called the First Amendment that allows us to publish their information online. But our deal is we want to help you fix your problem yourself. So you so, can go on uh, to the site and look for it information about how you as a consumer can move forward. You don't have yes. to just say, hey, Chris, help. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are some cases where you do have to do that yeah. and where, you know, they've, they've tried everything. You know, when you fill in that form that I was talking about before the break, you actually have to include all of, we ask for the paper trail, which shows that you've tried to fix the problem yourself. Mm -hmm. So we really, we don't go after a business in the same way that maybe, you know, seven on your side will, uh, will just go, you know, we're going to, you got this uh, viewer, we're going to come out and get you now. We don't do 60 minute style interviews where we hold the camera really close until you have the beads of sweat are on the mouth and we're, we're trying to uh, get back at you. It's, it's a much more nuanced and professional and collaborative way that we do our advocacy. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we, have you, we kind of make sure that, for example, the the, com the company knows, the company is given an opportunity to fix the problem right. on multiple occasions before we ever have to get involved. Right. And and have you found that there are some companies that stand out in your mind for their willingness to work with a consumer or a consumer advocate if one gets involved? Are there some good, oh, absolutely. Give some shout outs maybe to some of the really good shout companies? outs. I'll give you some, some of the good and some of the bad. Sounds that? Good. All right. The, the good companies just strictly in the travel industry. Um, the, the good companies are Southwest airlines yeah. to some extent, JetBlue gets good marks, uh, Marriott and Hilton intercontinental hotels, all uh, to varying degrees. And depending on the brand, uh, I'll get high marks. If you're staying in something like a Ritz Carlton, the uh, the car rental brands that stand out are Hertz and Enterprise. Those and, and Avis too, to some extent. Right now, uh, we're running a Reader's Choice Award, so the balloting is underway right now for the 2018 Reader's Choice Awards, and we're getting a lot of people who are voting on their favorite uh, company. So the travel industry that those are those are the ones that that are providing good service. Uh, Royal Caribbean does well for cruises. Um, the winners haven't been set yet, so there's still some balloting going on uh, among car manufacturers. People tend to like the Japanese car manufacturers. So Toyota is getting really high marks. Honda, uh, Acura. Uh, the uh, we also have wireless uh, cell phone. Manufacture cell phone providers. Verizon is doing pretty well. Uh, AT&T not so much. And then you know, to seg to the the bad companies, we get a ton of complaints about American Airlines. Any of the ultra low cost carriers, Spirit, Allegiant, the, those tend to to get more than their fair share of complaints. And um, you know, for for hotels, it would be any of the brands that are considered budget or cut rate. 
uh, that that kind of don't do so well. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it uh, AT and T, as I said, is is not people's favorite right now. Yeah, I just uh, switched out of AT and T to Verizon myself, but that it, reason. It, yeah, um, and then for a cable, uh, Comcast which was everyone loved to beat up on Comcast, but now everyone is really liking Comcast yeah. because they've made a really big effort, concerted effort to fix their customer service. So yeah, that's uh, around the world in 60 seconds for me. Mm-hmm. So now when you say there's balloting going on, where do people go if they wanted to vote or they just wanted to yeah. see the outcome? Again, uh, Elliot.org, so two L's and two T's. If, and if you uh, navigate to the top, that navigation bar, you'll see Reader's Choice Awards. And just go there and you can take that ballot. Um, I, I hope you do because uh, the balloting ends pretty soon. And in, this is we're going to make a really big deal about it this year. We've got a press release going out for the Reader's Choice Awards and an audio media tour. So I'll be doing a lot of interviews like this, uh-huh. uh, talking about the winners. Cool. Now, the, I want to make very clear, I, I'm sure, that these winners do not get to give you any money. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no. The way that it works is we have people who are sponsoring the awards, but they don't get to determine who is the the who's nominated. The readers determine who's nominated, and there's no money changing hands in exchange for the awards. Of course not. We'd never do that. Yeah, I would hope not. But <laughs> and I thought it, maybe we should make that clear to people because people are always looking for those catches, aren't they? Oh, there's got to be something wrong here. Yeah, no, that's not how it works. Not with the Reader's Choice Award. It, it's That really is the readers making the decision, and you can't make that stuff up. Yeah. If you do, you get into trouble. Hopefully, yeah. Now, I, I was an economics major as an undergraduate, and I studied, of course, Adam Smith and the free market, and now we live in this age where people are talking about <clears throat> capitalism and socialism bad and capitalism capital. And you know, to some degree, I, I certainly agree with that. But one of the tenets of capitalism is an informed consumer. And what you are doing is informing the consumer. Hi, folks. Welcome back uh, after a short technical glitch. Mm-hmm. Technology is wonderful, but sometimes it goes awry. Chris, I, I was saying that I was an economics major in college <clears throat> and studied Adam Smith and, of course, the whole idea of capitalism, which is a wonderful system. But the basis of making capitalism work is an informed consumer. 
And in effect, that's what you are doing, is you are being the informed consumer for the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it strikes me that that's a pretty cool thing to do. We have some very spirited debates on our site in the comment section between people who consider themselves pure free marketers and those who would want to, I would say, carefully, thoughtfully regulate businesses. Mm -hmm. And there are people who believe that the government has no purpose, no role in regulating a business, telling it that, you know, for example, you have to tell the truth about your prices. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have that situation right now in several uh, businesses where the price that you're quoted, you know, look at your wireless bill, for example, or look at your hotel bill. Go to Las Vegas and you get a nice uh, $79 a night rate and then you go to check out and there is a $25 a night mandatory uh, hotel resort fee that's right. been added to your bill. Mm -hmm. Now that in my mind is not capitalism, that's just lying. And you, you would, no matter how you slice and dice it, no matter how you try to explain it away, not telling someone before, as, as you are quoting a price, it can't be like at the end of the booking process, that's lying. At the very beginning of the booking process, telling them that there is this fee, quoting them a rate that includes the fee, <clears throat> that's for me the essence of capitalism, right. is that it's a market where you're telling people what the price is and they're saying, yes, I want to buy this product at this price. So we have these very animated debates between the free marketers who say government should never ever tell you what you can and can't say. It's a free speech issue. You should not be able to say that the hotel costs $79 a night when it really costs $129 a night. And then the people who say no, that is lying and the government has a legitimate role in regulating that and telling people you may not lie. There are limits um, to free speech and lying in the marketplace is one of those limits in other words. I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, and I, um, I tend to, to veer toward the thoughtful regulation side, where if you should allow a business to say what it wants to say, but if it can't tell the truth, the government needs to step in and say, it's time to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not really a free market argument at all. But there are some people who really do believe that that is how a free market should, should go. You know, usually when I run into somebody like that, I pull out my jackknife and I say to them, yes, and I'm a neurosurgeon and you need that aneurysm right there, you know, point to the end, right there, remove this instant, here I go. And they say, wait, 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 you're not a neurosurgeon. I said, but I just said I was and you're not tell you're telling me it's okay and that, you know, they, that nobody should be able to stop me, right? Yeah, well, right. The government has no role in licensing doctors, so uh, I'm a doctor. Right. Um, bend over or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I, well, since I, I'm more up here, I'll go for here. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it gets really interesting, and this kind of segs into the whole situation right now in politics right now where you have the fringe extreme that has – hijack the whole political debate and you can't be in the middle you have to choose you're either on the far left or the far right and i i have really tried very hard not to get sucked into that in, in the advocacy because i think that whether you're a republican or a democrat or a centrist or a communist or a socialist if you get screwed by business you're going to need our help yeah. so let's not muddy the waters with politics and let's get down to the business of helping you mm -hmm. now do you have a you, we mentioned your website. I was wondering, does your organization have a presence on Facebook? Yes, we do. Uh, we, uh, and I have a link from my site, Elliot.org, to my Facebook page and my Twitter page as well. And uh, you can go. I would encourage you to like the page and to to sign up for uh, and also to, to uh, follow the Twitter account because we, we also have a lot of fun things that we do on those accounts that you're not going to see on the page giveaways, things like that. We have fundraisers where we try to raise enough money to keep the lights on and to keep the advocacy going. And uh, so if you if you sign up for the Facebook page, you'll, you'll get all that too. Mm -hmm. And do you have a newsletter that you... I do. I have an email newsletter you can sign up for too. 
le.org. And if you go forward slash newsletter, you can get the sign up page or you can just navigate to it from the front page. Because mm-hmm. you see, folks, there's, there's a lot to be learned. And I've been, during the last couple of weeks since I first had contact with Chris, I've been looking at his site, getting some of his emails and things. And I have to tell you, um, it's amazing to me how many things you're, you as a writer and you as your organization as an organization seem to be doing. Uh, it's, it's a massive amount of work. It's a huge amount of work. I would never, ever be able to do it all alone. You know, I work pretty long hours as it is, but without the volunteers that assist me, it would just not happen. So my hat's off to them. They're, they're all great people, and they all have, like me, a rescue complex. They want to help, and they can't stop helping people. I think that I've always had this discussion when someone else comes along and tries to do what I do. Um, you know, there have been other kind of Q&A columns that are published. I mean, the New York Times is running one for a while called The Hagler. Uh, Unfortunately, that one got canceled. And then Consumer Reports also had a great site called Consumerist. And they just pulled the plug on that site, unfortunately. But whenever a new competitor comes along, my attitude is it's about time. We need more people doing this, not fewer. So when people uh, fill out that volunteer form that I was telling you about before the break, I say, this is great. We need more people doing this kind of work, helping other consumers, because uh, corporations are not going to say, oh, yeah, let's set up some more consumer advocates. They're not going to do that. No. They want fewer of us. Or uh, they want to set up <clears throat> consumer advocates that really are obfuscating. You know, well, we're, and, we're and self-regulating, <laughs> I which means we go out use... to play golf once a month. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I would hate to use the word fake consumer advocates um, because I think everyone who gets involved in advocacy really thinks that they're helping, wants to help. And I have used the term fake consumer advocates before the word fake news was invoked. But I think that there are people out there who are a little bit misguided. Um, they, there are entire organizations out there that uh, are they're nonprofits. They say that they're funded by businesses, but they say that they're there for consumers and they have that kind of split alliance or allegiance rather and and that's not really in my mind possible i'm not going to name any names right now but i think you know who i'm talking about and it's uh it's very um discouraging to see those organizations going out there and carrying the mantle of we're consumer advocates when in fact they're entirely funded by businesses they're extremely business friendly they're always going to side with the business they take legitimate uh, comments from consumers and sometimes we'll delete them or hide them and uh, I think that that's just wrong it's kind of like the fox guarding the hen house so you know you, you have to watch out when you're out there dealing with advocacy groups that you're not dealing with one that is has is getting money from or is somehow has an uh, allegiance to the corporate world as opposed to being in the side on the side of consumers right I couldn't agree more with you and, uh, of course, the problem with a lot of the newspaper and local news and, and uh, magazines and such, also when they try and do it, is that they are profit-driven businesses. <clears throat> hey, if, you come, if your uh, advertisers say, hey, you can't do that, don't do that, <laughs> at some yeah. point you say, oh, geez, do I want to shoot myself in the foot or in the pocketbook? <laughs> I've only gotten into that situation a couple of times when I was at National Geographic Traveler. Uh, we did have an advertiser once who threatened to pull all of his ads. There weren't that many. And my editor told them to go fly a kite. Hmm. And uh, that's the correct response, yeah. uh, always. But that's a, um, that's a real unfortunately, high-end organization. <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately, the way that it kind of works is it's, it's a little different. It's, um, it's a self... Um, chilling kind of thing where you have, for example, I have a syndicated column that I try to sell to newspapers and it it gets to an editor who looks at it and says, yeah, this is going to help our readers a lot. But then the next thought is uh, our advertising department is not going to like this very much because we're here, we're calling out the AT&Ts and the Verizons and the American Airlines and uh, there, and those are also major advertisers. So, 
it, it's chilling in the sense that they're they're just going to say, no, I don't want to run this column. We're not going to pick it up. Instead of it getting to the point where you've got uh, an advertiser that's upset by a column and then threatens to pull ads out of a particular newspaper. Right. It's a little bit more, unfortunately, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that and makes it a real challenge because, you know, I have a column right now that I'm trying to sell called Problem Solved and it is really, really tough. And we'll, that thought will be right back. I've been mediating disputes between companies and their customers since 1998. Oh, I remember my first case. It was a woman who had a question about her film being damaged by the airport x-rays, and I helped her answer that one. After that, I was hooked. I've devoted my career to helping people. I love what I do, and it's an honor to help. The most common question that I get is, is that really you? And the answer is, yes, it is. I answer every phone call, every email, and I mediate every dispute myself. I live for the emails and the phone calls that say, hey Chris, it worked. I got my money back. I got a refund. Thanks so much. I'm not an online personality or a brand. It's just me fighting the good fight every day. I have a rescue complex and I will do everything that I can. Everything, really. Welcome back to Walking on the Wean Side and my wonderful guest today, Christopher Elliott, and I'm just going to remind folks, you want to go to Elliott.org, and that's Elliott spelled with two L's and two T's. And Chris, you, your organization and your work make such an important case for use of the internet, use of <clears throat> uh, this kind of connectivity to allow all of us to get better information and, and to share information in open ways. <clears throat> and right now there is an issue that has reared its ugly head once more called net neutrality. And I would, well, can't resist wanting to ask you your position and your thoughts on that topic. <laughs> well, as you know, uh, my site does not really advocate for bigger issues as much as it does for individual cases. Mm -hmm. So if someone were to approach us and say, uh, my service is being throttled, uh, we would then go to the provider and say, why are you throttling this guy's internet service or cellular service? And we've had some cases like that, but not, not most people can't tell that their service is being throttled because they're just not that sophisticated. They wouldn't know to run a speed test or anything like that. But that said, as I look at net neutrality, um, I, I really see this as a fairness issue, is uh, for a company to be able to say, oh, we're going to uh, reduce our speeds for this user and then increase our speeds for this user and charge more, it really goes to the issue of fairness. Um, it is, I would disagree with the current uh, FCC administration that this is a free market issue or uh, regulating the market issue. I think it's more of an issue of you've got, you know, you've got traffic signs and traffic lights and everyone obeys those traffic signs. Everyone understands the benefit of that. Uh, and now you've got someone saying, you know, that's too much regulation. We should take out these stop signs because we want people, we want the free market to decide when people should stop and when they should go and they can pay the consequences for it. And if they, they want to have a fast lane where that they own all to themselves, then without any stop signs, they should be allowed to do that. And I think that this is kind of equally ludicrous to say, we're going to take all of the traffic signs. We're going to remove the speed limit sign. And let's let people do whatever the market decides, you know, whatever they can. That would be like driving so, in Boston. <laughs> Your words. I uh, I actually had a pretty good, good experience driving in Boston when I was there, but I'm told that it can get crazy. Oh, very, uh, very. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, there are other examples of that that are just, um, you know, I would say on the whole, they're good for some consumers if you've got the money mm -hmm. to pay for the, the fast lanes and, you know, you're in a good place. But if you don't have the money, you know, and if you rely on your internet service for more than just checking your email. 
And we're a really good example here. You're at your home. Yeah. I'm at my home. We're both in Arizona. And we've been cut off once already during this interview because of bad Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And now imagine what will happen under, uh, you know, if net neutrality is removed, you know, they might be able to charge you more mm -hmm. or they might be able to throttle your speeds because you're just not that important to them. And I think that that's really unfair. And also it would make for a very difficult interview. And it would mean that our listeners would have a harder time being able to find out what we're telling them from In Matters Radio and maybe a harder time getting hold of and finding information from and sharing with uh, Elliot.org as well. Absolutely. And, you know, and I've, I've taken that. I don't know. Have you ever taken the political compass test where it tells you where you are on the on the compass? You, are you conservative or liberal no, or sure. whatever? And, you know, I'm I'm all the way off onto the left end of things, of course. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's not too hard to tell where I stand politically. But, you know, I I think that's a bit of an oversimplification because there there are some Republican and conservative ideas that I think are great. You know, I don't want to. For example, the Second Amendment. Um, I think that you should be able to have a hunting rifle and go out and hunt deer if you want to. I don't want everyone to have their guns removed from them. Right. I, um, I own a gun. I'm, yeah, well, gun you know, and we have guns in the house here too, although they're not mine. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that there are some really great ideas about a market. There are some markets that work better when they are uh, unregulated. Yeah. Airlines are a really great example. Utilities, not so much. So you, it's got to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. But, but I mean, so I wouldn't, like, say that I'm a full-on full lefty journalist who's just out, out crusading. But this thing with net neutrality and this thing that some of the other really crazy fringe Republic, Republican and right-wing ideas that this administration uh, is espousing, they're not just bad politically. They're bad for consumers, for most American consumers. So I just don't even know... What is going on in Washington these days? I just don't even know, you know? Uh, I want to step back on something you said a little earlier and just to extrapolate from it. You, you mentioned that airlines, deregulating airlines is good, but they're not really deregulated. They're less regulated. Yeah, but, uh, of course. And, you know, uh, there's this little thing about if you have two planes trying to land at the same time, <laughs> doesn't work too well. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I think that uh, you know people say deregulated, and the airline lobby loves to talk about that, about how they're deregulated, and you don't want to. Anytime someone in Congress says that they want to come up with a real common sense rule about like fair pricing or you know the or about fees not being too high, they go, "Well, you're going to re-regulate the whole industry." And the truth is, they are not deregulated, uh, not not the way that you and I would traditionally think of a deregulated industry. And they're also Safety subsidized. Regulated. They're also you know, subsidized. A lot of their infrastructure is paid for absolutely. by the government. Well, that's right, exactly. But but I mean, they're, they're also, um, there's some significant regulation when it comes to safety. And uh, you can't just, they can't just offer any kind of pricing. That's also regulated. The GDSs are regulated to a certain extent. Um, and, and so um, was deregulation a good idea, though? I think that if you go back to, you know, the airlines were deregulated in, in the uh, late 70s under the Carter administration. It didn't fully take place until the CAB was dissolved in the early 80s. And so you have, you can now compare things like prices. You know, back in the old days, in deregulation, the government had to, was telling airlines where they could fly and what they could charge. And that is... That is the kind of command and control economy thing that you would expect maybe under in the Soviet Union, right. but you would not expect it here. So deregulation made some sense, but um, has it been good for consumers? That's a much di more difficult question to answer because what you had was all these upstart airlines that came out in the, uh, in the 80s and then through the 90s. You had these startup airlines too, and then now you have – you have very little, uh, you've had a lot of consolidation, very little competition. And on balance, I think the government does have a role to play, more of a role to play than the airline industry thinks. So I think deregulation in general has been kind of neutral for consumers. Some good, some bad, but I think more needs to be done. It's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we're getting at here is 
that the process of really big, not local economies, but big national and international economies, it's not a simple, okay, we can go with this simple model, this Adam Smith model, nor should we be going with a Soviet Union, uh, you know, top-down model, but rather that in each industry there needs to be some way to figure out a working model, and that's a process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think you and I both believe is essential, whether it's a travel industry or automobiles or uh, phone service or whatever it is, is that part of that process of finding the right mix is having cons consumers' awareness, having right. the consumer informed. I, I completely agree that consumers need to be informed about what they're buying and it's very frustrating when I see companies that are intentionally trying to withhold important information or prevent the increase of consumer literacy. You know they're saying that the, the best consumer is the informed consumer. Well that's just something consumer advocates say. Con companies don't say that. Their best consumer is the one who is uninformed because they make stupid decisions and buy overpriced products at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want people to be informed at all. And I'm not saying that in a malicious or angry way. It's just that that's just what the kind of customer that serves them best, their corporate interest best, is mm -hmm. one who just goes in and pays the asking price for whatever it is they're, they want and then doesn't care if the quality is good or not. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the very definition of an uninformed consumer. Mm -hmm. And now, here you are, it's Black Friday, which means the stores are all open and all pushing their deals. You have three kids who are going to want to go shopping with Dad. And I'm just curious from the point of view of those of our watchers who are, who are parents, many of them are, um, how do you go about... You're out there and you have your, your, your daughter, say, and she said, oh, daddy, I love this, I love this. How do you get her to understand the process of making an intelligent choice? My children are very lucky because they get to see me every day negotiating with companies and talking about the value of a product or a service so they know. And they're actually minimalists. Now, one of the things I maybe didn't mention is that I'm, technically I don't have a permanent home. So I am I'm in one place for a month and then I move on to another place. Uh, you know, I do a lot of travel journalism too. And uh, so we don't have very much room to carry things with us. So we are by necessity minimalists. You're nomads. If, exactly. If my daughter wants something, it's got to fit in her bag. And so that's a good control mechanism right there is to say, yeah, it doesn't fit in your bag, huh? And I don't think we can buy that stuffed elephant for you. <laughs> but, but I also think that there are, there are conversations that you can have with your kids on a day like Black Friday or Cyber Monday or the sales that come after Christmas and New Year's. You know, the first week of the year is probably the best time to buy almost any consumer product because right. it's the fire sale. They're trying to get rid of everything, right. clear it, clear out the inventory for the new year. And you can have a conversation with your child. Do you need this? Do you really need this? You know, um, what are you going to do with it? I think that's a question we all need to be asking ourselves. Absolutely. Whether it's with your child or with yourself, or let's say you're one of those wonderful women who loves to collect shoes. Do you really need another pair of shoes? And then right. the question very often is, well, if I buy this pair of shoes, maybe I should get rid of a pair of shoes. <laughs> and in fact, that is one of our rules is that when we buy clothes, we get rid of one other, uh, you know, buy a new pair of pants, get rid of the, an old pair of pants because it's just not going to fit in the luggage anymore. <laughs> um, every child is limited to one piece of carry-on luggage, uh, honestly, and if they need to buy, go clothes shopping, it's because they actually need something. Um, you, know, you know the saying, you can't take it with you? I mean, like, literally, we have no place to take uh, anything with, and it's not like we're going to be dying anytime soon, hopefully, but we really can't take it with you. Uh, we can't take it with us. 
But I think that that kind of conversation is something you can have internally, too. As you say, you can look at yourself in the mirror and go, what do I really need to get today? Or am I just going shopping and make myself feel good? Uh, an obsessive shopping disorder, or, uh, it's a compulsive shopping disorder, that's what it's called, yeah. is a real thing, and there are treatments for it. And you, if you have a compulsive shopping disorder, then you are every business's best friend. They're going to love you. And with that because, thought, we do have to stop for today, but I have to say, folks, that I have so enjoyed having Chris Elliott with me today on Walking on the Wean Side. I hope you've learned some stuff, and I really hope that you'll take the time and go visit Elliott.org. That's with two L's and two T's, as Chris mentioned. He also has his own website that is mostly for his travel writing, and that's Chris Elliott with an S at the end, dot com. And you might want to go look at that as well, and also like his page on Facebook, the Elliott.org page on Facebook, and follow him on Twitter, because this is a guy who's doing something that's really important for all of us. Thank you.